wisdom, prudentia, justice, justicia, temperance, temperantia, courage, fortitudo. Applying ancient philosophy to modern life, this is the Sunday Stoic. Welcome to the Sunday Stoic Podcast. This is Steve. This week we're going to continue our progression through the great Stoic philosophers this week with Gaius Musonius Rufus. Musonius Rufus is best known as the teacher of Epictetus, but he has some excellent lessons of his own. He was born around the year 20 AD and died somewhere around the year 100 AD. During the reign of Nero, he was a well-known Stoic teacher and he was involved in the Stoic opposition and he was therefore sent into exile. Eventually, he returned to Rome, but again he was sent into exile, to an island. He returned to Rome again and became the teacher of Epictetus somewhere around that time, and for a third time he was sent into exile. But he returned to Rome after Emperor Vespasian's death. I'll put links in the show notes for a more complete biography. But this is someone who will have good advice on adversity because he was exiled three times, sent away from his home three times. He gives a lot of practical advice in his writings, uh, advice from raising children to what clothing to wear to what kind of furniture you should have in your house, even how you should trim your hair. He has a lot of practical everyday advice that folds in the philosophy of Stoicism. This week and for the next week, or two after, we'll focus on some of the writings of Gaius Musonius Rufus. The Fragments of Musonius Rufus by Cora E. Lutz, number six on training. He was always earnestly urging those who were associated with him to make practical application of his teachings, using some such arguments as the following. Virtue, he said, is not simply theoretical knowledge, but it is practical application as well, just like the arts of medicine and music. Therefore, as the physician and the musician not only must master the theoretical side of their respective arts, but must also train themselves to act according to their principles, so a man who wishes to become good not only must be thoroughly familiar with the precepts which are conductive to virtue, but must also be earnest and zealous in applying these principles. How indeed could a person immediately become temperate if he only knew that one must not be overcome by pleasures, but was quite unpracticed in withstanding pleasures? How could one become just when he had learned that one must love fairness, but had never exercised himself in the avoidance of selfishness and greed? How could we acquire courage if we had merely learned that the things which seem dreadful to the average person are not to be feared, but had no experience in showing courage in the face of such things? How could we become prudent if we had come to recognize what things are truly good and what evil, but had never had practice in despising things which only seem good? Therefore, upon the learning of the lessons appropriate to each and every excellence, practical training must follow invariably, if indeed, from the lessons we have learned, we hope to derive any benefit. And moreover, such practical exercise is more prudent for the student of philosophy than for the student of medicine or any similar art. The more philosophy claims to be a greater and more difficult discipline than any other study. The reason for this is that men who enter other professions have not had their souls corrupted beforehand and have not learned the opposite of what they are going to be taught. But the ones who start out to study philosophy have been born and reared in an environment filled with corruption and evil, and therefore turn to virtue in such a state that they need a longer and more thorough training. How then, and in what manner, should they receive such training? Since it so happens that the human being is not soul alone, nor body alone, but a kind of synthesis of the two, the person in training must take care of both the better part of the soul more zealously as is fitting, but also of the other, if he shall not be found lacking in any part that constitutes man. For obviously the philosopher's body should be well prepared for physical activity because often the virtues make use of this as a necessary instrument for the affairs of life. Now there are two kinds of training, one which is appropriate for the soul alone 
and the other which is common to both soul and body. We use the training common to both when we discipline ourselves to cold, heat, thirst, hunger, meager rations, hard beds, avoidance of pleasures, and patience under suffering. For by these things and others like them the body is strengthened and becomes capable of enduring hardship, sturdy and ready for the task. The soul too is strengthened since it is trained for courage by patience under hardship and for self-control by abstinence from pleasures. Training, which is peculiar to the soul, consists first of all in seeing that the proofs pertaining to apparent goods as not being real goods are always ready at hand, and likewise those pertaining to apparent evils as not being real evils, and in learning to recognize the things which are truly good, and in becoming accustomed to distinguish them from what are not truly good. In the next place, it consists of practice, not in avoiding any of the things which only seem evil, and not in pursuing any of the things which only seem good. In shunning by every means those which are truly evil, and in pursuing by every means those which are truly good. In summary, then, I have tried to tell what the nature of each type of training is. I shall not, however, endeavor to discuss how the training should be carried out in detail by analyzing and distinguishing what is appropriate for the soul and body in common and what is appropriate for the soul alone, but by presenting without fixed order what is proper for each. It is true that all of us who have participated in philosophic discussion have heard and apprehended that neither pain nor death nor poverty nor anything else which is free from wrong is an evil, and again, that wealth, life, pleasure, or anything else which does not partake of virtue is not a good. And yet, in spite of understanding this because of depravity which has become implanted in us straight from childhood, and because of evil habits engendered by this depravity, When hardship comes, we think an evil has come upon us, and when pleasure comes our way, we think that a good has befallen us. We dread death as the most extreme misfortune. We cling to life as the greatest blessing, and when we give away money, we grieve as if we were injured, but upon receiving it, we rejoice as if a benefit has been conferred. Similarly, With the majority of other things, we do not meet circumstances in accordance with right principles, but rather we follow wretched habit. Since then I repeat all this is the case, the person who is in training must strive to habituate himself not to love pleasure, not to avoid hardship, not to be infatuated with living, not to fear death, and in the case of goods or money, not to place receiving above giving. So what Musonius is saying here is that virtue is not just something to memorize, but something that requires practice, something that's meant to be applied in our daily lives. We can't just claim to be prudent or brave or temperate just because we've read a book and thought that, yes, these are good things to be, but we have to have tested ourselves. We could fast. If we're scared of public speaking, we could engage in some form of public discourse. We could go to Toastmasters and give a speech. Um, We could do something else that we fear, like play guitar in public, right? We could do something more meaningful that might make us worried, like take place in a political march that could result in our arrest. Uh, We could spend time helping those in need. All of these things are, are virtues embodied in practice, so actual applied virtue. Virtue that is not applied is just thinking, right? It's not actual virtue. He warns us that practicing philosophy uh, is likely to be harder than learning a new skill like medicine, at least medicine at the time, right? Uh, so learning medicine or learning some professional skill is not as hard as becoming virtuous, Because if you're learning medicine, you usually don't have to reprogram your thinking unless you've been brought up uh, to believe in some pseudoscience form of medicine hook, line and sinker. And you have to be you have to relearn uh, the scientific method and, and why we practice medicine the way we do in the West. Right. When it comes to philosophy, we've been taught the wrong things usually our whole lives, that riches are good, that fame is good, that 
spending hours and hours in front of the TV and then going to the store, going to Amazon.com and ordering various products are good and that death and poverty are evil. And these are things that we have to unprogram from our ways of thinking. Only things that are in our power really have the ability to be good or evil. So the way we act, the way we respond, how well we fulfill our roles in this world are where true good and evil lie. But we have to reprogram ourselves to live this way, and that takes a lot of work. So when we're training, he says we have to train the entire person, not just the soul, not just the body. So not just our, our faculty of reason and not just our body. We have to train the whole deal. We might need a strong body to live a good life that is useful. We might have to do physical activities to do that. We also need to strengthen our inner character. Now, some training, he says, strengthens both soul and body, making yourself more resistant to heat and cold. So letting yourself get cold, letting yourself get a little bit hot, and just living with it. Uh, getting thirsty, but not drinking right away, getting used to being thirsty, uh, uh, living with hunger for a while, so fasting, avoidance of pleasure, and being patient while, suff while suffering. These are all things you could do to work on your body's strength to resist these things as well as your own inner soul's ability to, to uh, exhibit patience and self-control. So you're working on your Ability to overcome heat and cold, but at the same time, self-control and patience. Now, some forms of training, he says, is just for the soul. And some of this is, is sort of more academic, I guess, but, but you really have to work on it and look for proofs of this and remind yourself of these things every day. He says that for the soul, we must learn that what everyone calls good is not really good, and the thing everyone calls evil are not really evil. And then we have to practice distinguishing the difference between things that are truly good and things that are not truly good and things that are truly evil and things that people just call evil. We have to become good at telling the difference. And then the next step is to stop avoiding things that only look evil and then stop, uh, stop uh, avoiding things that only look evil and, and, and actually stop real evil things. So being intemperate, being, uh, getting angry, things like that are things we really do want to stop doing. And we have to stop pursuing things that only look good, that only seem good. And we have to start doing all we can go all out pursuing real good, our own character, justice, prudence, things like that. We have to pursue those things with all of our strength. So we have to live up to our ideals and these are all things that we can do in the 21st century. To live well, we must not run away from hardship. We must not uh, fear death so much that it paralyzes us from action. And in the case of money, we should place giving above receiving. There's actually hints of stoic charity there. So these are all things we can do. Uh, things that we can do to improve ourselves, to become kinder, more honest, more content people. So this week, think about practical ways to implement the four virtues in your life. So practical virtue, actually doing it, actionable virtue, not just thinking about it, but doing it. What could you do? Just little things to start and, and that you could build up on to become a more virtuous person. Think about that. If you come up with any great ideas, shoot me an email at sundaystoic at gmail.com and I will see you next week. Carpe diem. Thank you for listening to The Sunday Stoic. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review The Sunday Stoic on iTunes. Become a member of The Sunday Stoic team, earn rewards, and be an integral part of the show by becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash sundaystoic. Contact the show by emailing sundaystoic at gmail.com or by leaving a voicemail at 501-503-3132. To find out more, visit www.sundaystoicpodcast.com. And as Steve always says, carpe diem. Welcome. 
Welcome to the Stoic Cosmopolis, a podcast for Sunday Stoic patrons. 